So after Far Cry 3's dog shit drove me to the brink and I had a 30 minute on stream meltdown about the toilet water characters, janky ass mechanics and appallingly irritating gameplay, I thought it would be a brilliant idea to play Far Cry 5. You see, I dragged myself through Far Cry 3 over the course of the longest weekend of my life, spending decades, no, lifetimes, crawling through one of the shittest games I've played in my 25 long years on this planet, only to learn that my save file was a mere 21 hours long? After a marathon of willpower like that, I arrived at Far Cry 5 jaded, miserable, and prepared to suffer for the sins of allowing my community to choose the games I play. And it was actually really good. Yeah, I have to say, I really liked it. It's the closest thing to mindless fun I can describe and still enjoy. There's a main game with a co-op campaign, a bunch of cool DLCs, an ultimate difficulty, and some crappy online mode that, like my potential, died in the womb. You can whiz around on an ATV and run down enemies and innocent citizens with a mere slap on the wrist. You can buy a menagerie of GTA-style vehicles and weapons to commit the deed with, and you can fly your co-op partner into the ground and hear them scream with rage as they die in a fiery inferno. It's great. There's no problem with mindless fun in my opinion. Some games are just fun games and this is no exception. So before I carry on, I want to be really clear. This is a fine game. It's literally fine. I have no complaints about this game. If you want to play this and just enjoy it for what it is, that's fine. Please don't assume I'm telling you how you need to perceive the game, how you should enjoy it. It's good. I enjoyed it and I would and do recommend it to people. Two thumbs up from me. I just thought it could be better. Let me tell you why. Actually, before I start, I just have to say, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, and consider popping over to my Twitch channel to say hello, and maybe air your grievances with me in person. And beware, super spoilers ahead. Like, I'll spoil the entire storyline and then some, so make sure you've found peace with that before you watch any more of this. To reiterate one final time, I thought the gameplay of this game was completely fine. The gunplay is smooth and simple, the animations are fairly uninvasive and feel very natural, the movement is quick without being erratic. Driving's easy, vehicles have a natural weight to them, fishing is fairly chill with some fun RNG based challenges, and the crafting is basic but effective. The auto aim's a bit clingy, but I guess that's a hard line to walk. Besides the fact that the throw grenade button is assigned to the button I'd usually associate with a weapon wheel, often causing me to obliterate passers by with an errant grenade when they're just trying to go about their day. It was astounding how many times I'd toss a stick of dynamite into a shallow pond while going for my fishing rod. But still, it's not a bad game by any means, the music especially is so well done, combining real life and fictional songs together to make a really good voiced OST. Really thematically suitable, hauntingly beautiful, and immersive as fuck. The missions in this game are weirdly varied as well. Between the Herc missions, that testicle festival thing, and whatever else mad shit they somehow justify, I felt like they genuinely tried to keep things fresh and introduce a lot of new ideas. There's a lot of variety, and although it doesn't always land, it's nice to see some actual effort in diversifying the gameplay in a Ubisoft game. I can't imagine the strings they had to pull to be allowed to try something new, and I applaud the designers for however much child sacrifice they had to perform to be permitted to do something besides the absolute most basic shit. The characters were also different and interesting enough to be memorable. Pastor Jerome, Grace, Herc, Nick Rye, and my actual son Cheeseburger, they all serve to add a lot of fresh colour to the map. They're visually diverse and consequently very memorable. They have their own personalities and they don't all feel like a horde of smooth spongebobs that have been written by the same homogenized little focus group of vaguely affable human beings. I feel like every named NPC has their own contribution to make, their own opinions, motivations, moments, triumphs, goals, and a fairly rich set of dialogue to go with it. It's just a shame they go nowhere with it beyond go blow up five boats, because then they might actually write an actually compelling story and that would be fucking stupid, why would you do that? On that line, and perhaps onto the negatives here, the story was pretty trash. It was half-baked. Imagine finding a gold mine and filling it with concrete to use it as a parking lot. Sure, yeah, it works, but imagine the possibilities you've just strangled in their sleep. And it was so relentlessly half-baked that even months after finishing it, I still have enough to say to write an entire script about it. So let's go. My frustration with Far Cry 5 came down to one thing. It didn't do anything. Some of you might fairly argue games don't necessarily have to be something or say something in order to be valid. They don't need to have a set of metaphors, associations, 
implications or deeper meanings. And I agree. I don't think games have to have a wider philosophical meaning, and this game especially is still worthwhile playing as it is. But still, there's a weird grand illusion in the land of gaming that games can be apolitical. For some reason, Ubisoft tries to pivot itself as such despite framing its narratives around extremist fascist governments, tackling, but not really because that would be too offensive, subjects of racism, religious extremism, and violence on the regular, usually basing their narratives around open quote, fictional governments that are open quote, no relevance to the real world, except they completely are. It's impossible for a person or a team of people to sit down and write something and not be in some way influenced by their own personal experiences and biases. Politics seeps into everything whether you like it or not, and just because it's not about the gays doesn't mean it's not a political story, making a statement about our lives and the world around us. Politics isn't just when Bethesda changes their logo to a rainbow during Pride Month, it's more deeply rooted like that. And if you disagree, dislike this video and fuck off. I'll see you on Twitter. Still, considering the unignorable cultural context of the present day United States, the unavoidable connections that can be made between the game in real life, and the fact that it is impossible to make art without being even unconsciously influenced by your own life, experiences, and the world around you, this egg sat and stagnated in the dark instead of hatching into something of genuine value and insight. I just felt like it could have been so much more than it was. Considering how common it is to make games set in the USA, revolving around American characters, this setting was honestly a fairly unique one. Far Cry 5 is set within a huge bowl of earth in the middle of a mountain range, isolated by road and satellite completely cut off from the world, a microsystem with its own religious, political and social atmosphere, unobserved, unregulated and unopposed by any outside forces. In Far Cry 5, religion is the sun around which the lives of these people revolve, a cult of personality elevates and deifies a single unhinged ruler who presides on the back of a lunatic's doomsday prophecy. Military might is the dominant force here, innocent citizens are the playthings of the wealthy elite, forced to submit or die with a smile, and the weakest members of society fall prey to false promises and substance abuse. So yeah, it's not exactly fantasy, is it? With this in mind, the game has a really strong opening. You are sent into this rogue sovereign nation and intrude upon the sermon of Joseph Seed. This Christ or antichrist figure with an overheating problem and a love of garish yellow aviators, he preaches at you for some minutes, going on about the rider called Death, the seals of the apocalypse and how it's all beginning, yada yada yada, you get the picture. You can handcuff him, or if you want a really ineffectually dull ending just for the sake of saying you did it, you can wait a while and walk away, ending the game prematurely so that you can immediately reboot it and actually play what you paid for. Once Joey Seed is bagged and tagged, you escort him to the helicopter and his followers become more and more upset, beginning to shout and chase you, clinging to the sides of the helicopter in this weird violent animalistic rage, clawing to get the messiah back. Said messiah is just softly singing Amazing Grace, his voice not even breaking as the helicopter whirls out of control and crashes to the ground. As your character fades out of consciousness, he picks up the radio and calls off the backup, revealing that his network of followers has infiltrated your own police unit and he isolates you here forever. The solemn, dark title screen hits, his haunting melodic singing still in the background. It's fucking nice. Good job, Ubisoft. Having also dragged my ass through Assassin's Creed Valhalla like a dog with worms on the living room carpet, and angrily tripped and fallen through the tangle of weeds that was Far Cry 3, I genuinely did not expect actual quality from a Ubisoft game. I entered Far Cry 5 with the lowest expectations imaginable, and found myself in the midst of a really impressive concept for a game that absolutely doesn't pull it off. Well, better luck next time, Yubi. You see, the game has all the makings for a real satirical examination of the best and worst of the United States, how it became what it is, what that truly means, and what it offers the rest of the world. Even the front of the box tells you, this game is all American. Except it's about a deified fascist dictator who uses religion as a crutch to stamp on the least advantaged in society and reap the rewards of that exploitation. And he's a lunatic. Hmm. Joseph Seed is a weedy little messiah figure with some allegedly divine powers. Through some strange source, be it divine, supernatural or mushroom based, Joseph sees visions of the future, doomsday specifically, since it never seems to be a positive thing when people have premonitions. He's set up really well in the prologue. You and your team helicopter down to his little base, a small church on a pretty island in a lovely area of mountain, overseen by some enormous statue, and march on him and his minions to try and arrest him. He's clearly a very flesh and bone 
known person. Average height, skinny brown hair, man bun. Looks like a yoga instructor. Just a pair of garish yellow aviators and some rusty old jeans. You ask yourself, what is it about this guy that's earned him such adoration? What has he done to accrue such a following? What does he promise? What does he offer? What does he give them that they need? What does he do to attract so many followers in the first place? Is he supposed to look like Western Jesus? Because he kind of does. His ability to see the future is clearly legitimate too, being that the game ends in all-out nuclear warfare, but we'll get to that. To look at Joe in more detail, let's focus on his family. Our boy Joe sits at the head of a family of three. Well, technically four. Three and a hanger-on. Beneath Joe are his two brothers, Jacob and John? Yes, John. John, Jacob, Joseph and John. John, Jacob and Joseph. And yes, they are really hard to remember. Alongside them is a woman called Faith, a little sister but not really who just kind of wandered in one day and now walks around barefoot despite also pioneering, building and managing a multi-million dollar military grade chemical production industry out of nowhere? Each of the three mini antagonists represents a wildly different concept. Jacob is a battle-hardened war veteran with a degree in cruel psychology and a twisted sense of community. He's obsessed with Darwin and rooting out the weak from the strong and has taken a few insidious teachings from Pavlov too. Basically this guy's a certified freak with the kind of politics the weird devil's advocate kid in class would describe as harsh but fair. Jacob wants to cull the herd. He takes the weak, crams them into little cattle cages and puts them out of their misery. When I first began his story I thought he represented the pitfalls of blind nationalistic militarism. I thought he represented exaggerated toxic military might, lack of emotional support and treatment for returning veterans, PTSD and the needless loss of life in fighting wars that help nobody but the elite. Considering the game takes the time to explore Pavlovian conditioning in a way that really piqued my interest, I was optimistic. In my first playthrough I genuinely didn't realise his plan until I'd killed my ally at the end of his story arc. I thought that was pretty clever. I liked the Bioshock-esque deception here, the way the sequence became natural and uninvasive, something I would sit back and formulaically work through until I knew every enemy spawn didn't need to think about what I was doing. I thought it was a comment on the cold-blooded nature of military might, how killing becomes a matter of practice makes perfect, repeat, 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 until it doesn't matter who's on the other end of the gun. The videos, the flashbacks, the visual and auditory hallucinations, the fits, the triggers, an interesting examination of PTSD that despite making for an interesting ending, doesn't do very much else. I thought his inclusion in the story might say something about racism, the separation of perceived genetic advantages and disadvantages, the genetic engineering he engages in, survival of the fittest all ring closely to Nazi experimentation and the theory of hierarchy of race. He even has a shady little asylum in the northernmost part of the map, out of which he performs his experiments. Considering the Nazis took many of their initial ideas from early 20th century America, I thought Jacob would embody that marriage of ideas, an all-American guy, a noble and distinguished war veteran a Nazi. Still, Jacob's arc was the strongest and most promising, and credit where credit's due, but it only gets worse from here. My least favourite of the four, Faith, is a mystery woman, some stranger who basically appeared one day and joined the family seemingly out of nowhere. She's wearing some strange pseudo-wedding dress, kind of tiptoes around gracefully whilst manufacturing industry volumes of bliss, a drug so powerful that it melts the minds of addicts and leaves them staggering around the place like a cat on Valium. She was the biggest disappointment in the game for me. You see, Faith's a nobody. She's a ghost, a siren, a myth. A mysterious young woman who walked into the valley one day and suddenly controls an entire third of the nation, using the Henbane River region to mass produce an incredibly potent dangerous drug. A potent dangerous drug she is seemingly completely immune to. She flies around with wings made of the stuff, appearing out of nowhere to blow it in your face even though she's not got the pockets to carry it in? How does she fly? How does she make wings out of drug fumes? Did she make them herself? How do they manifest? Is it magic? How does she lift you to the top of a statue, hundreds of meters off the ground, and then fly away? Compared to the other bosses, she's an almost ethereal abstract presence. While the others might use might, she uses magic in a way that stands out starkly against their arsenal. Almost as though she never exists in the first place. Almost as though she's a concept, an idea. As though whoever hears about her will suddenly begin to see her, and that she appears differently depending on everyone's expectations of how she might look. As though the bliss only cat catalyzes her existence. Once you knock some back, you begin to see her and she shows you what you want to see. Almost as though the game was winding up to a very clever reveal that her name, 
faith would be so very relevant to her embodiment, that it was your faith in what you were told about her, your faith that she was a living, breathing person, that would be what causes her to manifest. That faith was only visible to those who believe she is real, and in reality there is nothing but smoke. But no, she's a smog witch with a tragic backstory, like the Cruella de Vil of Radioactive Hooker. Finally, there's John the youngest brother of the three. He's a 10-10 on the hot crazy scale, with a passion for flaying innocent screaming victims, whilst being eerily calm, self-righteous, and preachy. Once the aforementioned prologue arrest goes tits up, as to be expected, your four comrades are split between the three members of the family and taken off to be mutilated, drugged, or forced to listen to the platters. And before you can grab your shit and bail, you need to go and fetch them. Jacob, the alpha of the pack, gets some Grima worm tongue throwaway, who basically slobbers on his dick throughout his chapter until he's inevitably slaughtered in front of you in a way so woefully obvious to anyone who's been paying attention for more than six seconds. Faith gets the sheriff and the deputy, the former of which lost his son to bliss, the latter of which becomes addicted, and John gets the woman, and you have to save her. She doesn't really have any lines or any bearing on the story, so there's not much of a mirroring going on here. There is some bloke called Jerome who gets flayed, but in regards to your team, she's definitely the weakest link, being that I don't think I remember her saying a word throughout the whole story. Between this and the fact that John seems to sit around doing fuck all all day, he's definitely got the weakest arc of the three. He's just a weird Batman villain who got the wrong end of the stick on how to do tattoos. John is intended to be the first sibling you visit, but I didn't hear the instructions, so I struggled through Jacob's region first. John was the last one I saw, and yeah, he was a disappointment. So John's thing is that he says yes, and he also writes people's sins on their body and flays them to absolve them. Okay, I thought, watching his weird little introduction, it's about the American dream. The concept that ambition is all that separates each individual American from achieving fame, fortune, and happiness. The idea that suffering is a choice, and that all you need to do is say yes, bite the bullet and face the pain, and you'll come out on the other end transcended. Everything will immediately be okay, the pursuit of happiness. There's no success without suffering. When in reality, the dream is a lie, the game is rigged, and unless you're born into that place of privilege already, you'll likely never even see a glimpse of it. The people in power, like our boy John here, impose these ideas like a sick game to get their kicks, and no amount of flesh you could ever offer him would satisfy him. There is no way to win his game, only bleed out at his hands. And then you kill him in a plane fight is a weird one. This game was strange for me in that way. I constantly went into situations that pleasantly surprised me at the promising setup and then left them absolutely shaking my head over the blue ball payoff. I don't know if the concepts set up here are explored further in notes or documents around the game or external dev and designer interviews, but I'm not a massive loser, so I'm not going to do my homework on a game I found astoundingly disappointing. You see, there's a lot going on with cool villains right now. The best villains are the crux of their own media, from Handsome Jack to Andrew Ryan to GLaDOS to Oh, I don't know, farce? And in movies and TV like American Psycho, Wolf of Wall Street, Breaking Bad, and The Joker movie, it's easy to see that modern audiences absolutely love a nuanced take on villainy. The mind of the villain is one of the most interesting lenses to see a story through, and is incidentally why Batman is typically the most boring member of any media he's in. But the best villains are villains that represent something. Looking back at gaming in particular, it might not seem like it, but the best villains are direct manifestations of political ideas and theories, usually in a way that mirrors the protagonist. In film, the Joker is the chaos to our Batman's order. Vars is the cold, established killer to our Jason Brody's improvised psychopathy. Flowey is the genocidal maniac you could very well become after being locked in the cycle of Undertale over and over and over again. Villains are politics. And I feel like Ubisoft put together a trio of three truly unique and interesting boss concepts, all orbiting a fairly unique video game setting, and just needed one final push to turn them into characters that would have gone down in history. Borderlands 2's Handsome Jack represents cold globalization, the scourge of capitalism, in the wanton destruction of our planet for the sake of progress that helps only himself. He's essentially a relatable Twitter account for a cold, faceless corporation. He's charming, witty, intelligent, and even funny, but he would kill you and everybody you loved at a moment's notice if it meant another dollar bill in his wallet. He's charming but sociopathic. Funny and likeable but immensely cruel, a true manifestation of the hungry, evil capitalism he represents. He's basically what Elon Musk wants to be. Bioshock's Andrew Ryan represents the philosophy of objectivism, based on real-life philosopher and author of Atlas Shrugged, 
Ayn Rand, who incidentally has an incredible amount of influence on the game. Andrew Ryan believes in the idea that someone should be able to profit uninhibited off their own ambition and skill, a quaint idea in theory, but throughout Bioshock's narrative you'll see many of the gruesome and needless consequences of imparting such a coldly ambitious philosophy on an isolated society of people, how it's impossible to greedily constantly take without harming others, and that this selfish philosophy will only cause others to double-cross and hurt one another, a constant, unending, painful rat race until the community crumbles under the weight of its own self-sabotage. Andrew Ryan teaches us that there is no unlimited pool of resource. The more one person hoards, the less there is for everybody else. Unlike Far Cry 5, Borderlands 2 and Bioshock both had something to say. Both had observations to make about the world we live in, the systems we live under, and the philosophy that influences our day-to-day. -day. Every villain you see on any top 10 villains in gaming list represents some ideology, system, or politics for the protagonists to face on both a physical and ideological level. Moreover, both games are remembered for being fun, accessible, good games. It's possible to be a good game and still have something to say, be that implicitly or not, and yet I felt like Ubisoft cowered away from making even the smallest statement on anything, too scared to offend or seem as though they were even remotely critiquing modern day America. As a result, the game felt limp and lifeless. With all this absolute lack of substance, the game ends up just being one big empty sandbox. And to be fair, that's fine. I played the game solo and multiplayer and I had a really good time both ways through. You can hitch a ride with your partner in a plane of your choice, only to hop out and parachute to safety while your mate is flung into the nearest mountain, car park or grizzly bear. You can even turn friendly fire on in the pause menu and ruin their day, only to toggle it off at your own leisure just before you revive them. If you see a beehive, you can shoot it when your friend walks under it and they'll be assaulted by a swarm of rage and you can sit back and piss yourself while they shout at you. But without that narrative meat, that compelling idea, those interesting themes, it just ended up being some kind of basic first person shooter with the classic multiplayer mode that hugely overestimates its own popularity only a year or so after release and it's already dead in the water. Just another game that everyone's played but nobody really has an opinion on. If there's anything Borderlands 2 and Bioshock has taught us, it's that a game can be as political as you like but make it good and fanboys will defend it until their dying breath. After all, of Bioshock, Borderlands 2 and Far Cry 5, which are the ones that are remembered years later, and which dropped out of the public eye the second the next big title rolled around. So yeah, my final verdict on Far Cry 5. It's literally good. It's fine. It's okay. Unmemorable but solid. Mechanically adequate. I had a lot of fun with it personally, especially after the dumpster fire of Far Cry 3, but I couldn't help sit there and wonder how good, how truly groundbreaking this game could have been with just a little bit more purpose, a little bit more of a willingness to break the mould and say something new. I honestly believe that with the right focus on the right themes, the proper characterization, and less basic bitch blow up five boats gameplay loops, this game could have been something. But it's Ubisoft, so obviously it wasn't. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much for hearing me out to the end of my review of Far Cry 5. Thanks to my patrons for their generous support, and please like, subscribe on YouTube, go check me out on Twitch, and thank you for watching.